right? So. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, if I, you can't hear me from the back, you know, wave your hand. I haven't given a lecture in about a year now. Um, so I was told that I was supposed to give a somewhat of an overview of concepts in cellular and molecular biology to prepare you for any more of the developmental biology talks that would occur. I apologize in advance to those of you who have a bio, an extensive biology background because this is probably a little more than you want to see after all these years. Um, and probably I should apologize to the engineers in case this is way more than you want to know, but in any event. So some key concepts that I'm going to go over um, fairly rapidly and briefly are basically um, eukaryotic cell and its nucleus, the central dogma, gene expression and transcription, some thoughts on how that's regulated, cell signaling, which is um, a key component in how gene expression is regulated, cell-cell and cell matrix interactions, which are things that you're going to consider in terms of um, the mechanisms in movement of cells, movements of sheets of cells that you'll be hearing about later on in the week. Um, sorry about that. The embryonic inner cell mass, so the vertebrate embryo, mouse, humans. Something about how they develop and the stem cells that are derived from that inner cell mass. And finally, a little bit about morphogenetic re regulation. So just to get into it, the eukaryotic cell and its nucleus. So your standard eukaryotic cell, cell membrane, obviously, the nucleus in the middle, we have a whole bunch of mitochondria responsible for generating the energy, the ATP, that's used in me metabolic processes, endoplasmic reticulum, um, necessary for protein synthesis, Golgi apparatus for protein modification. So we're interested primarily in what's going on in the nucleus. So obviously, within that nucleus, we have the genomic DNA. So all the information that's encoded in the cell is in that genome. You're going to have replication or synthesis making copies of that DNA so that when cells divide, they end up with copies. Each has an individual copy of that genome. The other activities that go on within the nucleus are transcription from the DNA to produce messenger RNA molecules, ultimately going to be translated into protein. So this brings us to the central dogma. So basically, we're starting off with that genome, the DNA, all the information encoded in the nucleus of the cell. That's going to be transcribed into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is going to provide a template for translating the proteins that the cell needs. So within the nucleus, we have that ongoing synthesis of the genome, making copies of it for when the cells divide and proliferate. We have messenger RNA transcription from that genome, so taking the information encoded in the genome and turning it into a template that's a useful form for later protein synthesis and translation. Okay. However, the central dogma had to undergo somewhat of a revision a couple of decades ago when there was the discovery of the reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is used by retroviruses, and this was a discovery made by Howard Tem and David Baltimore, who used to be the director of the Whitehead. So when you have a retroviral infection of a cell, all of the, the RNA and the viral proteins are injected into the cell. That virus actually has its own reverse transcriptase enzyme that's capable of actually using the template of the RNA molecule and making a DNA copy. So this is sort of contrary to the original central dogma concept that information only flows from DNA to RNA. So in this case, we now have information being used in the form of the mRNA template, the RNA template, to make a DNA molecule. That DNA molecule is then actually integrated into the host's genome, where it can in itself, itself be used to generate more RNA molecules and more messenger RNA molecules that are going to form the viral protein. So basically, the virus co-ops the activities of the eukaryotic cell. So if we look at the central dogma in the context of the entire cell, we have ongoing chromosome genome replication. Um, all that DNA has to be wrapped up and packaged properly. So if you're looking at a human genome, you have about two meters worth of DNA, of linear DNA. So you have to think about the fact that it has to be packaged so that it's going to fit within a cell that's about 5 to 10 micrometers across. So 
that's a lot of packaging that has to go on, a lot of condensation. So basically what happens is you have a whole series of um, proteins that are associated with the, chrom with the chromosomal DNA. A lot of those are histone proteins, and they basically form a scaffold around which all the DNA is going to be wrapped and thus com compacted so that you can put this enormous stretch of DNA into a cell. So we have chromosome replication. We also have transcription of that genomic DNA into messenger RNA molecules. Those are then shuttled out into the cytoplasm of the cell where you have protein translation taking place. And also you have proteins obviously that have to go back inside the cell, some of those histone proteins to repackage DNA. Okay. So one of the key um, processes that's going on in the cell at any point in time when, it has to, when cells are undergoing growth and proliferation is DNA replication. So you're ending up with another copy of the genome itself. So DNA synthesis is a semi-conservative process, which basically means that in the course of replicating and copying that genome, what you end up with are um, two new strands of DNA. And each one of those strands has one copy of the original template associated with a new copy. And if you basically remember any of your high school biology, you know that we have four different bases. We have a sugar phosphate backbone. Cytosine is always paired with guanine. Adenine is always paired with thymine. So one of the things that we can do in the lab and you'll be doing next week is to actually um, artificially copy DNA. So this was a technique that was refined by Kerry Mullis years ago in which you take double-stranded DNA molecules, you can heat them up so that you actually dissociate the strands. You have primers that are complementary to the strands of DNA. They're going to hybridize. You add nucleotides. You use a DNA polymerase that's derived from thermos aquatis bacteria, so it's very tolerant of high heat. So that every time you denature these strands, the enzyme itself isn't disrupted. So using those primers to start with, you're actually able to synthesize more copies. So what you end up with is every time you go through a cycle of denaturing, annealing primers, and extending those primers and copying the DNA, you end up doubling the numbers of copies of the DNA, so you have quite a, a large amount of DNA. So this is one of the things you're going to do next week in studying the embryonic stem cells. We're actually going to look at markers for different steps of either pluripotency or differentiation using this technique. Okay. So going back into the nucleus, in addition to DNA replication, we also have gene transcription. So remember in that central dogma, we have to have copies um, of DNA made into RNA to provide a template from which we could translate proteins. So again, that DNA backbone shares with the RNA backbone, the same sort of phosphate sugar nature. The only distinction being that in RNA there's a ribose sugar that has an extra hydroxyl group as opposed to the deoxyribose sugar in DNA. Also in RNA we have a substitution for the base thymine. Instead we are using uracil. So those are basically our differences in the sugars, our differences in the bases, the uracil in RNA, thymine in DNA, and an RNA molecule. So obviously when, you're, when the cell is going through the steps of making an mRNA copy of its DNA molecule, where you see an adenine in the DNA molecule, it will be transiently paired with a uracil molecule instead of um, the thymine base. Okay. So in the process of transcription, you need to have an RNA polymerase. It's going to synthesize the messenger RNA molecule, and it moves along the DNA as it's being unwound. You have your mRNA being processed. You have rewinding the DNA after the movement of the RNA polymerase along that length. So this is just basically a very, a very simplified version of what's going on. In a eukaryotic cell, it actually requires a lot more proteins than just an RNA polymerase to accomplish this task. Okay, so this is sim um, basically an EM, EM micrograph of bacterial chromosome in which you can see there are two different genes that are being transcribed. So these are the actual messenger RNA molecules that are being generated. So you can tell that for any gene in this particular chromosome, you have a whole host of polymerases that are sitting down and progressing along and generating all of these 
different mRNA molecules. Okay. So obviously gene expression doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's not a continuous process within a cell. So what's going on? So we have our transcription. You generate an mRNA molecule. It has to be processed. In eukaryotic cells, you have introns. They have to be removed to generate a mature mRNA. You add a poly A tail. You add a cap. These are helpful in um, stabilizing the molecule. It's exported from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm where it associates with ribosomes in the process of protein translation. So in looking at transcription, you'll realize that for any number of genes, you have different rates of transcription. So if you have gene A, it may actually be in the process of being copied far more frequently than gene B so that you end up with more transcripts of gene A than gene B and thus more protein product from those transcripts. So this is something that you're also going to look at in lab. So um, you can actually use the whole process of PCR in order to evaluate how many transcripts or get a rough estimation of how, many, how much transcription of a particular gene was occurring in a cell versus another gene. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that that reverse transcriptase is capable of using mRNA as a template to generate DNA. So in our case, we're going to be taking messenger RNA from embryonic stem cells and also differentiated embryonic bodies. We're going to be isolating the RNA. You're then going to go through the whole process of generating a cDNA copy from that messenger RNA. And then you're going to go through the, the steps of PCR. So if you briefly got a sense of the differences between genomic DNA and your cDNA. Obviously, genomic DNA, you have all the introns as well as the exons. So if you were going to go through the process of actually cloning out all the fragments from genomic DNA, you would have pieces that contain not only the exon material, the sequences that are actually translated into protein ultimately, but you'd also have all the intronic sequences as well, the non-coding regions. Whereas if you're actually going to make a library of cDNA molecules, you're starting off with the mRNA transcripts. You're then going through the process of reverse transcriptase and making cDNA copies. And those are actually what's cloned into your library. And so the difference being is that if there are differences in the transcription of one gene over another gene, these will show up in your library so that an mRNA that's less abundant in your cell is actually going to have fewer copies represented in a cDNA library. So in our case, we're not going to go to the point of actually cloning, but instead, we're going to revert to PCR in order to amplify our cDNA copies. And in the end run, when you run them out on an agarose gel, you should see a distinct difference between low expression of a gene versus high expression of a gene so that you'll have a much brighter product on an agarose gel if your particular gene was highly expressed versus one that was lowly expressed. Okay. So in looking at the cells of an organism, Obviously, they all have the same genomic DNA, so they all have the same genes, the same introns, regulatory regions within their chromosomal material. But there's probably some difference in how that material is transcribed at any point in time during the life of the cell. So obviously, we have different cells within the body. So in this case, we have neurons, we have lymphocytes, kidney cells, liver cells, brain cells, whole host of cells making up the body. Um, obviously, a lot of these cells, all of these cells are going to have common genes that are expressed, housekeeping genes, things that are, that are required for proper metabolism within the cell, um, aspects of the cell, the plasma membrane of the cell itself. However, you don't want to have everything expressed at any point in time. There's no point in it. It's a waste of the cell's effort, waste of energy. Um, if you look at a human cell, obviously, the entire genome is not expressed at every point in time during the life of the cell. So in order to get to this point, you have to have some sort of regulation of gene expression. So cells vary over time, what has to be expressed, what doesn't have to be expressed. So we have to have some regulatory mechanism that's going to take place that's going to regulate whether gene A turns on, whether gene B turns on, whether they're on together, to what rate they're actually transcribed. So there are several layers of control that are overlaid on gene expression. Um, you first off, if you look at the chromatin structure, so 
how that DNA is actually wrapped around all the proteins and histone proteins and compacted into the nucleus of the cell is a very important aspect of controlling whether or not a gene is actually expressed. So if um, the DNA is highly condensed, it's less likely that that gene is available for transcription. You have modifications of the histone proteins themselves that regulate whether or not a gene will be expressed. You have methylation of the DNA. You also have transcription regulation via transcription factors. So these are important determining when particular genes come on in the developmental life of a cell. Um, splicing is another way that um, gene expression is controlled. Just because you have one transcript that's transcribed from a gene doesn't necessarily mean you have one protein product. You can have various um, different types of splicing so that you have different exons that are left in the mature mRNA transcript that will generate different types of proteins. So once you have your mRNA out in the nucleus, you also have the possibility of mRNA degradation. So if that poly A tail wasn't long enough or the cap is missing from your mRNA, it's more likely that your mRNA will be degraded. Um, whole host of translational regulation. Um, steps within the ER in terms of once you have your polypeptide chain of the protein, whether it's folded properly. If it's not, it's going to be cleared out and degraded. So there's a whole host of things that lead from the transcription of the gene down to a functional protein that the cell is going to make a use of. Okay. So for the purpose of what we want to know about today, we're going to look at two different types of gene regulation. First, the chromatin state, as well as transcriptional regulation. So obviously, chromatin structure, how's the DNA wrapped around the histone proteins and associated with the other proteins within the genome? So first off, we have um, methylation of the cytosine residues. So in the eukaryotic cell, you have all of these histone proteins and associated other proteins. Um, these are very basic uh, proteins. and the whole assembly of DNA and chromatin allows you to package DNA down into fibers that are fairly small and thus compact into the nucleus of the cell. So this gives you the classic beads on a string um, description that you see in EM photographs. So these little black dots are the nucleosome core. And basically what this is composed of are the eight histone proteins two copies of each one of these proteins, the H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And so in an octamer of these proteins, you have the DNA wrapped around it several times, and that's that bead that you see on the string. So just a schematic of that point. So you have a whole length of DNA that's wrapped around each one of these histone complexes, what's referred to as linker DNA, before you arrive at the DNA that's wrapped around the next nucleosome core. So it just gives you the overall structure that you're seeing when you look at a chromosome in a cell. So can, you can go from these beads on a string to much more condensed loops of DNA that are looping in on top of themselves so that you have that whole two meters worth of DNA packaged properly to fit inside that very small micrometer level of cell. So the other thing we need to look at in terms of regulation is DNA methylation. Obviously on cytosine bases of your DNA, you can have a methyl group. This methylation is maintained during the life of the cell so that when you have that semi-conservative DNA replication, you're going to end up with that original DNA template molecule in the new copy, which is going to have its methyl group. But you need to have a methyl group on the associated um, nearby cytosine molecules on the opposite newly um, synthesized strand. This is accomplished by maintenance methylases that recognize the methyl group on that cytosine and add complementary methyl groups. Okay. So looking at methylation, we also have maintenance of the histones. So histones can be modified themselves. And this contributes to how the DNA is packaged around them. And both of these um, modes of regulating the chromatin's, overall chromatin structure are actually heritable by the cells. So once DNA is methylated, you have synthesis of the DNA when the cell is undergoing um, division. 
so that the DNA in the new cells will also be methylated. And the same is with, occurs with um, the histone proteins. Histone modifications are maintained in the, in the newly um, produced cells that result from division. So these types of regulatory mechanisms persist in new generations of cells. The other level of regulation that we want to look at is transcriptional regulation. So remember we had that um, diagram with the big fat RNA polymerase sitting on the unwound DNA with the transcription of mRNA. This isn't the only protein that's necessary for eukaryotic transcription. There's actually, in addition to the RNA polymerase, a whole host of transcription factors, generic transcription factors associated with transcription itself. We also have gene-specific transcription factors that are noteworthy for being seen only in particular lineages of cells. So transcription factors themselves contain a region that's capable of binding to DNA. Um, usually transcriptional activators are transcription factors that are actually um, have a positive impact on transcription, but you can also have transcription factors that have a negative impact. So instead of upregulating gene expression, you can actually downregulate gene expression. So here's basically our whole um, transcriptional complex. So not only is it combined of the RNA polymerase, but you also have mediator protein, the general TFs, um, a whole host of chromatin remodeling complex proteins that are responsible for um, modifying histones, unwinding DNA. And then we have transcription factors that can bind to enhancer regions, which can be either upstream or downstream of a gene, can be actually fairly distant from the actual start of transcription. And all these proteins have to act together to actually either negatively or positively impact transcription from a particular gene. So transcription factors are capable of actually recognizing the shapes of DNA. So this is based on the sizes of the major and minor grooves and also on the pattern of hydrogen bonds that are available for bonding, protruding from those base pairs. So we have the minor and the major groove. We also have the actual overall um, spatial orientation of bases within the major and minor groove. So we have the major groove at the top, the minor groove at the bottom for the GC and the AT, and then you can see that the relationship between the bases themselves relative to the grooves would change the overall shape of the DNA and what's what bonds are available to be made between the DNA and the transcription factor. Um, so transcription factors, question? Uh, so when, when a DNA um, wraps around the histone, um, I mean, how does it, uh, what, what is the bound? Is it, how does it bind to the histone? And is there a specific um, karate, or is it, you know, 50% definitely 50%? Oh. <laughs> Um, I think it's predominantly hydrogen bonding. I could be wrong. I don't know about the chirality. It's left-handed. Is it left-handed? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, different transcription factors. They can recognize, obviously, the shapes of the DNA. So they recognize different sequences. These DNA sequences or regulatory regions are also known as cis elements. So they're going to bind different um, lengths of DNA. And obviously, as I said, you can either enhance or positively regulate transcription, or you can repress or negatively regulate transcription. So this is just a list of various common um, DNA binding domains. This one in particular, MyOD, is one that I'm familiar with from graduate school. It's actually an uh, enhancer element bound by MyOD in skeletal muscle cells. So it's part of the whole cascade of gene regulation, gene transcription that occurs in going from an immature myoblast to a mature myocyte that's part of your skeletal muscle. Okay, so transcription regulation, positive and negative. So obviously, you can either upregulate, increase transcription, or downregulate and repress transcription. So all of this transcriptional activity, whether it's going up or down, is in response to signals coming from the cell, from its environment, from other cells. Um, so if you look at how this actually impacts the lineage of a cell. Obviously, if you start off with a cell and you have upregulation of some 
transcription factor some regulatory protein, once that cell goes through cell division, it might be that the cytoplasmic contents are unevenly distributed between the two daughter cells so that most of those proteins end up in one cell. Obviously, this is going to have an impact on future transcriptional regulation. If you combine that with the upregulation or induction of additional proteins, then you have different combinations of proteins which can, in the long run, lead to different lineages. So you have this whole interplay of whether proteins are there to begin with, how they impact future gene regulation, and the combinations of protein products, transcription factors available to interact with the DNA and either upregulate or downregulate transcription and thus generate the different cell types that you see in an embryo. Okay, so this is just, again, a very nice little uh, multinucleated myotube. So you have signals coming in from other cells. You have upregulation of MyoD, Myogenin, MIF5, MIRF4, leading to yet another transcription factor, which feeds back on those. These are also responsible for actually upregulating muscle structural genes, such as myosin light chains and myosin heavy chains, so that ultimately you have that all of the structural um, proteins are available for contributing to the contractions of skeletal muscle in an embryo and an adult organism. Okay, so this brings us to the outside of the cell. So obviously we have all this activity going on within the nucleus of the cell. We have DNA replication, we have um, transcription to produce messenger RNA, we have messenger RNA being translated into proteins. This doesn't occur within a vacuum. Obviously if you're looking at a multicellular organism, it's one cell is sitting amongst a whole bunch of cells. So this brings us to cell signaling. So obviously, one cell is sitting there with his population. You have cells that are going to signal to each other. So a cell is going to produce a signal. Another cell is going to receive a signal. And ultimately, what happens is that these signals, once they're received, are read out as some sort of event occurring within the cell, whether it's gene transcription, whether it's a change in metabolism, whether it's a change in the overall architecture of the cell, a change in the cytoskeleton so that you have a shape change. So we have different types of signals. Um, we have contact-dependent signals in which literally the target cell has a receptor in its plasma membrane, which binds to the signaling molecule that's also a transmembrane protein embedded in the plasma membrane of the signaling cell. You can have paracrine signaling in which one cell actually secretes a signal that's received by nearby cells. You can also have synaptic signaling, so your neurons are actually obviously sending out a signal to a target cell, so you can have a motor neuron synapting in a synapse on a skeletal muscle cell. You can also have endocrine signaling, so in this case you have a cell that's actually producing a hormone that's carried a fairly long distance to its target cell, so this is distinct from paracrine signaling, which is a more localized signaling form. Okay. So once we have a signal that's produced, obviously it's received by its recipient cell. Whether or not it responds to that signal is all dependent on a host of other signals that are coming in. But once you have a signal that's actually eliciting a response, something has to occur within that signal. So you have a signal that's coming in to the plasma membrane of the cell, and it has to be transduced into the interior of the cell. So you have a whole cascade of events that then occur. Activation of proteins, and you, anybody knows um, MAP kinases and MAP kinase kinase and MAP kinase kinase. So you have a whole cascade of activation of one protein after another. So basically we start off with our extracellular signaling molecule that's going to bind to a cell surface receptor. And this is just one example of signaling. They're actually signaling molecules such as glucocorticoids that can actually travel across the plasma membrane of the cell. So they don't need this extensive cascade. So you have a cell surface receptor protein that binds to the cell, and then you have a whole series of proteins below it and secondary signal messenger molecules that are going to transduce that signal, whether it ends up in some alteration of a protein, a metabolic protein, um, some sort of muscle protein, or you have a change in transcription so that you've upregulated or downregulated gene expression. If you've upregulated, Related expression, obviously, you're going to have transcription, you're going to have protein translation. You can also have changes in the architecture, so signals can actually impact the arrangement of the cytoskeletal elements so that the shape of the cell changes. Okay, so it just gives you a sense that we have 
um, signaling molecule receptor, and then this cascade of signaling proteins that leads to one of those um, changes in the cell, metabolic enzyme, um, a transcription, fac transcription factor being upregulated or altered so that it actually goes into the nucleus and decreases or upregulates gene transcription or a change in one of those cytoskeletal proteins causing a shape change in the cell. Okay. So we have cells signaling to each other causing changes of gene transcription. We also have the whole host of interactions within a tissue, within an organism, and these are mediated by cell-cell and cell matrix interactions. So if we look at a tissue, obviously you don't have just cells sitting around you know, in a mix doing nothing. You have cell-cell attachments. You have cell attachments between the matrix. So if you look at the epithelium, so um, the skin, your skin obviously is an epithelium, the lining of your gut. These are sheets of cells and they all have to have cell-cell attachments. In these cases, they have fairly strong cell-cell attachments that provide a barrier to the external environment or to things passing through your gut getting into the rest of your body. Um, you also have types of tissues that are loosely associated, so your connective tissues of your joints. So these are more um, situations in which you have cells embedded in the extracellular matrix proteins, so sort of a gel-like um, assembly. And all of these um, connective tissues have scaffolding proteins so that you have all these ma macromolecules such as fibronectin, um, collagen, that are going to provide the scaffold for your cells to sit in. So if we're just looking at um, in this case, probably be a gut epithelium since we have all these little villi that would line your gut. So you have connections between all of these cells, so that's going to provide a barrier. In this case, you have an epithelium that sits on top of a basal lamina, which is distinct in that it's one of its predominant proteins is laminin. We look at connective tissue, it's a more loosely, loose arrangement of fibroblast mesenchymal cells within an extracellular matrix gel. So we have cell-cell junctions, so all the cells are linked together. So there are a host of different types of adhesion molecules. We have um, immunoglobulin superfamily molecules, cadherins, selectins, integrins. So all of these are transmembrane proteins that either interact with each other or interact with different combinations of cell adhesion molecules, and in some cases with the extracellular matrix in which the cell is sitting. So this just gives you an idea of them. This is the neural cell adhesion molecule, which is similar to the ICAM, also a cell adhesion molecule. You have E cadherins. There are several different types of cadherins. Um, e, P for placental. Um, we have P selectins, which are important in how leukocytes travel along the blood vessels. We have intragrin molecules that are important not just in binding cells to cells, but also in binding to things such as fibronectin which is a commonly used extracellular matrix protein in tissue culture. So we have all sorts of type variations in cell-cell adhesion molecules that differ depending on the cell type, depending on where the cell is found within an embryo, within an adult organism. So in this particular example that I'm going to show you, we actually, the researchers actually took a population of L cells, which is a common rat cell line, and they actually modified um, the expression of cadherin molecules. So they had two different cadherin molecules expressed in two populations of cells and they mixed them and allowed them to sort out. And you'll find that populations of cells will actually sort on the basis of what types of adhesion molecules are, are expressed on e in each individual cell. So that they'll tend to stick to the ones that have the same adhesion molecule. So in this case we have our standard L cells. We had one in which one population of cells in which P cadherin was introduced, the other in which E cadherin was introduced. So they're also tagged, um, I believe this was immunohistochemistry, so in allowing these cells, mixing these cells and then allowing them to sit in a dish and sort out, you ended up obviously with um, whole areas that are staining for P cadherin, so you can tell that all these cells sorted out and were sticking to their fellow cells that express P cadherin, whereas other cells we're expressing E cadherin, and they also tended to sort out into big areas. So it's a distinction in how cells will sort depending on what cell-cell contacts they're capable of making. 
So not only do you have linkages between cells themselves, you have linkages between the cells and their external environment, the extracellular matrix, which contains a, uh, an assortment of glycoproteins. So all these proteins bind to each other, to things like collagen, to receptors on cells. Um, one of the ones that was particularly useful in um, looking at embryos are fibronectin. Fibronectin generally uh, is bound by integrin transmembrane proteins, so the cell adhesion molecule integrin, not only does it bind to other integrin molecules and other types of molecules on different, bringing two cells together, but integrin can also bind the cell to an underlying fibronectin molecule in the extracellular matrix. So if you've ever done a lot of tissue culture, and we're probably not going to be using this this upcoming weeks, but fibronectin is something that's commonly coated on the bottoms of cell culture dishes when people want to study cells that aren't really that happy about sticking down to the dish. Um, once you put cells down on fibronectin, they'll actually spread out and attach. So they'll link to the fibronectin via their integrin molecules. Um, in embryos themselves, fibronectin is a fairly common um, extracellular matrix model that molecule that provides a trail, so a pathway for cells that are going to move within the embryo. So you have cells that start in one place and move out within the embryo, such as neural crest cells that leave the top, the dorsal top of the neural tube and transit out to other areas of the cells. So commonly, fibronectin is a pathway that these cells can actually move along, link up to remodel their contacts and follow along within the embryo itself. Okay, So this just gives you uh, a view of cells in a dish sitting on fibronectin. This staining for the actual fibronectin and then this is um, simply staining for the actin molecules of the cytoskeleton. You can see that the arrangement of the actin molecules fairly mimics the fibronectin molecules themselves. So the cell will spread out along the fibronectin and sort of orient itself to the substrate on the dish itself. Okay. So we have um, all these cell-cell adhesion molecules, and then we have cells being linked up to the extracellular matrix. We also have linkages between that extracellular matrix to the cell adhesion molecule, and then that cell adhesion molecule in the plasma membrane of the cell is also linked to the, in the interior of the cell. So there's a, a link between the cytoskeletal architecture of the cell, the actin molecules, microtubules, and the outside environment of the cell. So that things aren't occurring as just discrete units, but you actually have a chain of molecular interactions from the fibronectin out in the dish via the integrin molecules in the plasma membrane of the cell, and then integrins actually interact with linker proteins to the actin molecules within the cell that make up the cytoskeleton so that you have all these connections that are constantly being modified when cells are actually migrating. So remember that you have not just migration of cells within an embryo to get from one area of the embryo to another area. You also have um, instances in which cells have to move, such as wound healing. So if you cut your hand, obviously, cells have to move into the, the area of the cut. So they have to be able to modify their connections. Um, metastatic cells in cancer, they can actually remodel all of their cell-cell and cell matrix interactions so they can actually pick up and move to where the, they shouldn't be traveling. Okay. So you have to think about all of this in terms of we have information in the cell. It's going to be transcribed into mRNA and thus proteins. So that information is turned into a useful form, the proteins of the cell. These proteins are part of the cellulose processes in which you're taking information from outside the cell into the cell. So that indeed, it will change the transcription of genes so that you have proteins that are made in response to signals. You have cell-cell contacts and cell environment contacts that modify further what information is coming into the cell and how transcription will be changed. Um, so all this leads up to looking at our, our embryo itself, in this case, the embryonic intercell, um, intercell mass from which stem cells are derived. So if you look at an early um, embryo such as a mouse or a human, you have a blast, in a blastocyst stage embryo, so it's basically a hollow ball of cells. But on the inside, you have what's referred to as the intercell mass, so it's a little group of cells. 
And these are the cells that are going to actually give rise to the embryo itself. The outer cells are going to give rise to the trophectoderm, which is part of the cellular structure that um, allows the embryo to implant. So embryonic stem cells are actually derived from this inner cell mass. Um, and these are the cells that you're going to be using in lab. So mouse embryonic stem cells, they're pluripotent, which basically means they're capable of giving rise to all the, the cell lineages of the future embryo. The only thing they can't give rise to are the trophectoderm cells. So this just gives you um, basically the early stages. So this is your two cell embryo, so it has two blastomeres and the two polar bodies, an eight cell embryo, an eight cell embryo that's been compacted. You have the beginning of the generation, the blastocyst cavity. And then you have this sort of strange lumpy side, which is actually the inner cell mass of the cell, of the embryo. So as I said, your inner cell mast cells are pluripotent. However, um, if you're still at the early, early embryo with those two, those first two cells, the two blastomeres, these cells are totipotent, so they can actually contribute not just to the embryo, but also to the trophectoderm. And this just gives you a staining of one of these blastocysts, so you can see that all the cells have been stained with propidium iodide, which is simply a stain that binds to all the DNA. So it's going to bind to the DNA in every single cell within this blastocyst embryo. OCT4 is actually a marker of the inner cell mass in pluripotent stem cells. So you can see that it's very nicely lit up just one little area of, of the blastocyst, which is the inner cell mass. And then this is simply an overlay of the OCT4 staining with the DNA staining. Okay. So embryonic stem cells, obviously there's a reason that everybody works with them. They can grow indefinitely in culture. If you put them back into an embryo, they can actually give rise to all the tissues of, an or of the organism. So Embryonic stem cells are used extensively in creating knockout mice. So in knocking out a gene in an embryonic stem cell line, once you've knocked the gene out in your stem cell, you can introduce stem cells back into the blastocysts of a regular a wild-type mouse. You would then look for mice that have a com um, are chimeric, so they have, they're made up of a mix of cells that have the intact gene as well as the engineered gene that um, in those cells that are derived from the knockout ES cells. Um, so not only can you put these cells back into an embryo and they're going to give rise to the tissues, if you grow them in culture and actually um, give them appropriate signals, as you're going to be doing not only this week but next week, you can actually give rise to differentiated cell types. And depending on what combination of signals you, can, you give them, you can actually drive them to take on a different fate. So as with Bill and Seb, Sebastian, you're going to be driving them to become motor neurons, whereas in um, the second week, we're probably going to be driving these more to a generic, sort of just letting them become embryoid bodies, which should basically have a whole host of different types of tissues, of uh, cell types represented. And in our case, we're going to probably be looking at whether or not these embryoid bodies actually express markers that are specific to the cardiac lineage. So ES cells, that early embryo with the inner cell mass, we can culture those cells, put them back into your embryo and, or maintain them in addition, give them the appropriate signals, and they should give rise to a whole host of cell lineages that are found in the embryo. Okay. So this has led in recent years to the generation of induced pluripotent stem cells based on what people have learned about the genes that are seen in those early embryonic stem cells when they're still pluripotent. Um, by introducing uh, a set of genes, OC3, OC4, so that marker gene that we're going to be looking at, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, various labs were able to convert fibroblasts, so just generic mesenchymal cells or skin cells, into cells that had the properties of BS cells. So they took your skin cell used viral vectors to introduce this set of genes, and they basically were reprogrammed into a pluripotent cell. Obviously, there are considerations in terms of you know what you're going to do with these cells and the possibility that you're dealing with um, reprogramming that could 
in essence lead to some sort of cancerous phenotype as well. So this is ongoing work, especially in Rudy Yanish's lab and Rick Young's lab here at MIT that they're working on. Okay, so finally we come into um, morphogenetic regulation. So basically you're starting off with that blastocyst stage embryo with the inner cell mass. It's a very boring looking little structure, you know, it's not much going on there. So how do we get from that point into, you know, something like us? Limbs, hands, brain, everything. So this is all part of the morphogenetic regulation. So we have genes being turned on, but what are they leading to? So in terms of getting to an organism that looks like an organism, you have obviously cell-cell connections, you have cell movement. Um, so you have to remodel adhesion molecules. So you have to change those cellular connections so that cells sort out appropriately. You wanna have all the kidney cells hanging out with all the kidney cells all the liver cells hanging out together. You want to have a properly formed nervous system. Um, so you want to group cells appropriately. They need to find their fellows. Um, you want to have cell sheets of cells that are going to move. So in terms of structures like your nervous system, it basically starts off as the outer layer of your embryo, and it's got to, it's got to shift around. So it actually has to involute to form what's going to be the primitive neural tube that will eventually give rise to the nervous system of the embryo. Um, in very early embryos, you actually have um, movements of cells in order to generate the three primitive germ layers of a cell, of an embryo. So you have the ectoderm that's going to give rise to your nervous system and your skin. You have the endoderm that's going to generate all the organs of your gut. And then you have the mesoderm that's going to give rise to things like your skeletal muscle, your um, bone structure. So cells have to move around either individually or in sheets. So you have to have some mode of um, remodeling the cell-cell contacts, remodeling the cell matrix contacts. So remember, I referred to all those cadherin molecules. So this is um, a normal frog gastrula with its blastocyst. So this occurs by sheeting of cells that actually move in to form that pore. And a part of this is um, this nice maintenance of the structure in frog gastrula is dependent on cadherin molecules. If you introduce an antibody against cadherin, you get a very ugly frog embryo where all your cell-cell organization has obviously been disrupted by tinkering with the functionality of the cadherin molecules. Another um, event that occurs fairly frequently in um, not just embryos, but also in, in cancerous phenotypes and metastasis where cells actually move out is referred to as the epithelial mesenchymal transition. So again, this, has to, this requires that the cell is able to remodel its cell-cell contacts and its cell matrix contacts. So this is important in terms of the migration of neural crest cells. So they originate from the dorsal surface of the neural tube and move out. They become sort of the pigment. They carry pigment molecules so they'll contribute to some of the pigment cells of your skin. Um, it's also important in the development of somites in embryos. So somites are going to give rise to various tissue types, um, skeletal muscle, skin, some bone elements. So this ha also requires that the cells can change their contacts and move away and take up new positions within the embryo. So this is um, a chicken embryo we've removed the um, dorsal tissue layer. This is actually the neural tube, and these are the somites. So these are little balls of, uh, it's basically a ball of epithelial cells that pinches off from the paraxial mesoderm during the course of development so that you get all these little balls of cells on either side of the neural tube, and it starts at the rostral, the head end of the embryo, and extends down to the tail over the course of development. Um, so if we look at this embryo, we have the neural tube, the overlying epidermis, and then these somites. So they start off as these little balls of epithelial cells, and during the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, they'll actually start disrupting these contacts, so no longer are they nice little balls of cells, but they become more loosely associated, and some of them will migrate out, and they'll become things like the skeletal elements. They'll contribute to the dermis, but they don't stay in that, in that place, and part of the reason that they're capable of, of contributing to other different types of tissues is that they can remodel these contacts. 
So basically, what we've looked at is a whole coordination of what goes on in the cell, all the activities of the cell, how a cell responds to other cells, to its environment. So using that information that's encoded in the chromosomes and the cellular genome, you can generate all the proteins, all the molecules that are required within the cell, piece everything together properly, and this is going to enable the cell to respond to its environment and sort of keep the circle going of not only being able to respond to the environment, but using the signals that it's taking in from the environment to change how gene expression is regulated. And I think that's been the whirlwind tour. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions. are differentiated into different uh, types depending upon the signal. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends upon the type of signals or the quantity of signals or the both. It would be probably be both because a cell, is, it's not just receiving one signal at any point in time, but it can be receiving up to hundreds of signals. Mm -hmm. It depends on um, the variety of signals, the combination. It also depends on just what receptor proteins are expressed on a cell because just because the signal's there doesn't necessarily mean that the cell itself is capable of binding to the signal and taking it in and, and starting off that signaling cascade. So it would be a whole host of issues. So if we increase the signal up to a certain level, so... It doesn't necessarily have any, better, any more strong effect on the cell. There, there's... In some cases, there's a limit. You may, you may have like only 10 receptor molecules that are appropriate to take to bind to that signal. So throwing more on it, you, you've already gone past the threshold. And you also, in some cases, you have feedback so that once the signal has actually been taken in and a cascade has been started, it says, forget it, you know, I'm not responding anymore, and, and you'll have negative feedback on taking in the signal and activation. Um, sort of expanding on that, if you have a fluorocodon cell, would it have like an array of receivers uh, for molecule signals? And also the inside of the cell, would that just be able to handle all, all types of signals? It should be capable of responding to all types of signals. You have to remember that the pluripotent cell, you can drop them into different areas of the embryo, and they'll contribute to whatever, you know, whatever area they've ended up in. But a pluripotent cell wouldn't necessarily have a, a, a larger number of receptors or a larger variety of receptors, or what? I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's got, it should have the capacity to respond capacity. to signals, yeah. but it also depends on who's around it. Because it's not just what's coming in, but whether or not you know, neighboring cells have already responded to a signal are also going to play into whether it's also going to respond, whether it's a part of a population or it's not part of the population. That's probably more a question Lori is more capable of answering with better finesse. In a pluripotent cell, uh, to differentiate, uh, what are the Once you've started down a down a pathway of trend, you know tr transcription factors being upregulated in gene expression, generally you can't turn back the clock. You if there's a point at which that's a differentiated cell and, it, and it's going to continue on in that pathway, or whether it's becoming a skeletal muscle cell or a neuronal cell. In terms of coordinations, if there's an error, I mean, if there's an expression error, is there a way to correct it? Is there a correction mechanism? You mean if you've upregulated gene transcription yeah. and... If there's an error, I mean coordination. Even for us, when we do things, there are some mistakes. So is there a way to do a correction? <laughs> um, it depends on if the, you've got a signal coming in that can downregulate transcription. But I think usually if you've, if you've upregulated something abnormally, that's why you end up with something like a cancerous phenotype. It's something is in, it's inexpressed inappropriately. Is there any way you can figure something within the cells to correct that error? Um, 
I think that's probably the basis for a lot of a lot of work is how to turn how to turn things off because it's not only you have um, misregulated transcription in cancerous phenotypes, but you also have birth defects that in some cases result from inappropriate gene transcription or the lack of transcription. So what is the driving force uh, for um, missing, uh, I mean, I mean in, in, in metastasis with the um, efficacy of the in in terms of metastasis, it's um, yeah. <clears throat> I would think it's an accumulation of changes in the genes that lead to either overly active receptor molecules. So a lot of um, mutations lead to constitutively active receptors that don't even require the signaling molecule to come in. So the cell is sort of programmed to be you know, going to the point of proliferation and in some cases adopting what's considered a more embryonic phenotype, which would, you know, probably include all the processes of, you know, I'm not going to be stuck, you know, in this epithelial layer with this cell on one side and this cell on the other, but I'm actually going to transit out. Uh, a question, if you have histone and chromatin, and you throw it in some petri dish, will they form into a nucleus? A nucleosome? No. No. So how do they coordinate? By entropy or how do they actually coordinate among themselves to arrange into a nucleus? Um, you have sin you, when your cell is going through the process of growth and hopefully division, you're copying your DNA as your DNA is being copied, it's also being repackaged around chromatin molecules because you can't have all this, you know, loose chromatin flying around. It has to be wrapped around those nucleosomes, and then loops of the of the chromatin themselves have to be looped around so that you're actually packaging it into small and smaller so the volume. It's as your um, DNA is being replicated, you also have histone proteins that are being translated and shuttled back into the, the nucleus, or the actually nuclear area, and repackaging um, all that new DNA. So you can't do it from just... You can't just put it in a dish, no. No, and basically, um, I think when you go to isolate DNA, like if you took saliva and, you know, isolated the DNA from the cells, I'm not even, I don't believe that once you isolate DNA in that format that you even have any associations between DNA and histone simply because you've changed all of the the bonds, pH and everything else that's going on in the dish. I don't know how they did this experiment, but I, 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 I've seen one paper where somehow they isolated a single strand of DNA mm -hmm. that was wound around uh, a Well, you can do the, the beads on string. Yeah, but I guess like that. And then what they did is they, they pulled on it and then you could actually pop off the histone just by applying force to the DNA. So you're basically, you know, it's spooled around, and, and you know, like Leslie's saying, you know, it's, it's actually bound to the histone. But if you apply force on, or pull attention on the, on the DNA, you can unwind it and pop the histone off. But they, did they do the reverse, though? <laughs> it takes yeah. a little more the going on. Went off somewhere, I guess. <laughs> you can also make, um, if you just add DNA to histone, <laughs> And slowly lower the salt concentration. You can You'll actually the get them back. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. I work in PC. So. Oh. <laughs> you guys have questions. <laughs> so how do they do? It? Do they regulate by entropy? So it's um, at Change high bonds. salt. Um, you have ionic. Um, You're pushing them to it. So the DNA is really negatively charged, and histones are really positively charged. So at high salt, that keeps those interactions keeps the histones away from the DNA. But you need, really need to regulate the amount of, you need to have equimolar amounts of each histone. And as you slowly lower the salt concentration, um, the histones will start to sit on the DNA. And so H3 and H4 is a tetramer, and it sits on the DNA first. Um, and then as you lower the salt concentration, then um, H2A and H2B, which are two dimers, sit on, and then the DNA wraps into the body. 
get to a low salt concentration, and it's now just the, the positive and negative charges between the histones. Thank you. Just to add uh, in uh, Roger's comment, uh, um, they have uh, around 10 to 60 picolinton force is required to pop up each of the thing, and this is kind of I think in, in, in uh, Nature 2004-5, this, this paper came out. I can't remember where it was. No, it, so it was everyone starts out with uh, the organelles and the nuclear, nuclear membrane? Oh, they're, they're, it's eukaryotic cell, yeah. It's going to have an, its own nucleus, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, yeah, it's it's just like any other cell. It's got to have all the stuff to keep going. It's got to have all, you know. <coughs> Pardon? No, you, I believe you do have adhesion molecules in the ICM. That's how those cells are kept together in a in a group. That's how they sort out. So that's why at that point, once you've gone past that two cell stage of an embryo, you're already making distinctions between the cells that are going to become, you know, the outside ball of cells, the trophectoderm, versus the cells that are going to contribute to the inner cell mass. So those cells are already distinct. That's why they move from being the two cells that are totipotent. They become, they can be either lineage, whereas once you get to the, to having the outer layer and the inner cell mass, the inner cell mass cells, the ES cells as, as they're being used as, are only pluripotent now, so they can only give rise to the embryonic cell lineages and not to the trophectoderm as well. And then if you form an embryoid body from the ES cells, these are primarily adherent through a particular cadherin or just? I'm not sure off the top of my head which cadherin it would be. That's but one of yeah, them. Yeah, that would yeah. be one of them. Um, for generation of the kind of transgenic for example, in the session of the report for gene balancing models, this is the formative. Uh, what kind of parameter is important to consider? What kind of parameter is important to consider? For, for a tra to generate a transgenic line? Yeah. If you want to tra generate a transgenic line, number one, you don't need ES cells for a transgenic line. Mm -hmm. You can actually take your your length of DNA with whatever promoter you're using and shoot that right into an, an early staged embryo. Um, depending on what you want to study, you want to know if you want to drive another gene and you want to drive it specifically in some cell type, you need to have a promoter that's appropriate to that cell type. Like if it's a skin cell, you want to have something like um, one of the keratin molecules or something like that. I mean, if it was a skeletal muscle, you'd want to have something like myosin light chain. It, it depends on not only, you know, the type of tissue you want to overexpress a gene into, in, but also what time. Well, just more marking. I mean, a kind of reporting gene, such as GFP gene, and then I'm going to say that specific for me. You probably use something like an actin molecule, an actin promoter. That's a more generic, pretty much everything. <laughs> Every cell would have it, so every cell would recognize, would have the transcription factors that recognize the promoter elements. So, this cell differentiation just change in packaging of the DNA inside the cell, inside the nucleus? It's. So. Differentiation is what proteins have actually been upregulated and expressed. So, you're starting off with. You know, you may start off with one or two transcription factors, and as you go more down a lineage, you're going to upregulate other transcription factors. You're going to start upregulating the structural proteins that are specific to a cell lineage. Obviously, in the chromatin structure, yeah, there's going to be chromatin remodeling because you need to have particular genes be accessible to this transcriptional machinery, and that's going to going to change over time. So if you take a liver cell, put it inside the heart, does that update other transcription factors from other cells and then? No, because 
transcription factors have you can you can drive them in a cell like you can put in a, a transgene and upregulate expression of a transcription factor and in fact that that's one of the things that one of the early I think it was Harold Weintraub and the skeletal muscle field act they actually overexpressed myoD which is basically one of the master regulatory transcription factors that starts the skeletal muscle pathway and put it into a fibroblast, which is just sort of a generic mesenchymal cell. And we're actually able to drive that fibroblast to become a skeletal muscle cell. But they're not, you ha you'd have to experimentally manipulate that cell. You, it's not going to take up a transcription factor from the buddy next door who's got it. Oh, well, s mechanical signals, yes. Some cells can, will recognize mechanical signals like skin cells, cells that, you know, they're part of organs that obviously have to flex, like skeletal muscles and skin. Yes, there's, some cells can, will sense mechanical forces. Is that, am I following what you're asking or am I? Well, there's, there are stress fibers in cells that respond to, to, you know, whether a tissue is stretched or like things along. The too will, will change. You, you can you'll remodel, cells, you'll remodel the, the cytoskeleton itself. Yeah. Actually, I think most, most cells are actually capable of responding to force. So you can actually elicit a lot of different responses by, by applying forces to cells. You know, if you do it in, in vitro, you know, in a culture dish, you can plate down just about any type of cell, and, and if you either stretch it or poke it or do anything to it like that, the cell will respond by either changing the intracellular signaling or by, by changes in gene expression, actually. So you can get it, you know, you, you, you can differentiate the cell, you know, or, or cause it to express different different genes by applying forces to it. So even in real I, I assume so, but I, I don't know that people have worked very much with ES cells in terms of their mechanical response. I, I think, think Dennis Tischer's work on oh, sure. stem cells on substrates with different stiffness. That if you put a cell on a soft uh, substrate versus a stiffer one, you can actually drive lineage. So those cells are sensing the sub substrate, which means they're pulling on so basically, you can one minute has all the regular regulatory proteins in it, but based on the mechanical stimuli, you can control uh, the cells to preferentially differentiate into one kind versus another. Kind. In part. In part. And you can also do some other kind of stimuli, such as like light radiation, you know. Not many cells respond to light. I mean, there's a lot of work now with you know optogenetics, where you can actually turn on and off. Um, you, you you can use these um, light sensitive uh, membrane channels, so you can activate a channel by light, and then you can change the response of the cell as a result of that. So some people they they use this with neurons, for example, to to demonstrate that you can guide axons with light. Uh, you can stimulate certain parts of the cell by, and you can you basically change the calcium concentration locally in the cell by by light activation. Um, but certainly by, that's less common. I, you know, I think most of it's probably biochemical, um, but a lot of it's mechanical too. Mm -hmm. And then there are interesting combinations, like if you provide a TGF beta uh, to a fibroblast with stress. It will then differentiate into a myofibroblast where 
upregulates the stress fibers, increases the uh, size of its focal adhesions, etc. can generate more force. And that's, that's important in wound healing. So it needs both a chemical and a mechanical signal. Mm -hmm. um, with respect, uh, you probably the next one I ask. Um, so like if, if it does change with, with according to say like stiffness or something, are the responses generally tailored to that? So with like if it was softer, it might not uh, like the cell might not develop something that like protect it from the environment or something. Very good. Well I think you could take it in the limit. So if, if you have zero stiffness, a lot of adherent cells would, would die because they don't have anything to rest on and pull against and sort of stress themselves. And on the other limit, you may have a high stiffness, a rigid material, infinitely stiff. And, and that also may really uh, downregulate a lot of activity, and so you coat your petri dish with fibronectin, which gives it something with some, some compliance and as well as a favorable uh, sort of biochemical receptor for it to, to adhere to. So I think the answer is yes. How much this cell-cell interaction process depends on the dimension of culture when it's 2D versus 3D when they do the in-vitro <coughs> Does it have any impact or? I think it probably depend on the type of cell. Like some, some cells, a lot of cells are contact inhibitory so they don't want to pile up so you'd have cells that are prefer to grow in a sheet and in general we do have this kind of interaction among all the cell types or is it like specific to some cell types the contacts that they'll make are I think they're more they're more specific to the type of cell like an epithelial cell is going to want to make that sheet so it has cell cell contacts that are going along a plane and then it's going to have contacts to the underlying substrate molecules like a fibronectin or a laminin protein. Mm -hmm. so, so does it mean that in your in vitro cell cultures that you use a non cell line, uh, like a pot glass, and you just culture on the surface, uh, the cell density is not really going to affect the, the overall behavior of the cell? Oh, this, no, the cell density is important because there's a point at which if there's so many of them that they're all butted up against each other, they stop growing, they're contact inhibited. And that's one of the hallmarks of, of a normal cell versus a cancer cell is that cancer cells tend not to be contact inhib inhibited and they'll continue to proliferate and grow and they actually will pile up. And in terms of substrate, a lot of their assays that, to sort out what's developed a cancerous phenotype by putting them in like agar suspension, because a normal cell hates that, it's not gonna grow because it needs something that it can actually bind to, whereas um, cancer cells, you can put them in this an agar slurry and they'll continue to proliferate because they don't care if they're, they're not making contacts with something else. So apart from contact inhibition, in terms of gene expression, for example, there's not going to be enough of a change. Well, you're going to have, if things are contact inhibited, they're obviously not going to be expressing genes that are associated with growth and proliferation. They're gonna, there's going to be a shutdown. Because basically they sort they go into quiescence where they're just sort of sitting and hanging out. I mean, it it depends on it depends on whether it is a normal cell or a cancerous cell. I think a lot of that's still still being looked into in terms of, for example, cell migration. What people are finding now is that the the, the, the genes that are that control cell migration on, on a, on a two-dimensional substrate are very different than the mechanisms or the genes that are, that are expressed during three-dimensional migration. So, um, you know, I think if, if that's true for migration, it's probably also true for a lot of other processes, too. For interstitial cells? Yeah. Unlike endothelial cells or epithelial, which really prefer the two-dimensional surface. Yeah. But if you take an end, 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 endothelial or epithelial cell and put it into a 3D matrix, right. it's, it's probably going to behave differently. Okay, we should probably uh, have a 15 minute break, but first. Uh